Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jan, for the kind words uh, of introduction. Uh, I'm also thanking uh, the MSA for the for the support. Welcome, of course, the audience uh, online. Uh, a big thanks uh, goes out to Charlotte Wiedemann joining us from Berlin on short notice. We're sending our best greetings to Birte Kundrus, who cannot be here today for family reasons, and we wish her uh, all the best. And Last, of course, but not least, our thanks go to uh, Dirk, who has uh, traveled from New York uh, and visited us here in Aarhus. I think the weather has been perfect, probably a little less uh, heat than uh, even in New York. And so I hope that your travels were pleasant ones. Now, uh, as we begin uh, today, I will try to contextualize, give you a, a, a very quick uh, tour d'horizon of Holocaust research and Holocaust memory from 1945 to the present, from 1945 basically to yesterday. And then hopefully we understand the stakes involved in the discussions because these discussions are extremely intense at the moment. And as Luck wants it, we have two very important voices, two very important protagonists here that can help us sort this out. So uh, this has to do with uh, international research. It has to do with international memory culture about World War II and the Holocaust. It also has a lot to do with specifically German memory culture and the tensions and the differences that are uh, inexistent, for example, between German memory culture and memory culture in other places. So uh, very quickly, my, uh, my tour here uh, through the, the world of Holocaust scholarship and Holocaust memory begins last week. So uh, we have had two incidences uh, in Germany, but also beyond um, incidences of uh, anti-Semitism where we are hoping that Holocaust memory gives us a guideline how to deal with them. One of the incidents as I'm referring to is the last week's press conference where Mah Mahmoud Abbas uh, was together with the German chancellor and uh, Abbas made a problematic statement, uh, a statement that one could say is uh, banalizing a Holocaust history. And there was no immediate response uh, from the German chancellor. That has been heavily discussed. Holocaust memory is a guideline that should ideally tell us how to deal uh, with these kinds of uh, incidences. A very similar one that is, has been heatedly discussed in Germany and beyond is the appearance of anti-Semitic imagery at the Documenta in Kassel, one of the most important art, if not the most important art exhibit um, in Germany, held every five years, and now this time curated by an uh, artist uh, group from Indonesia. And there were a number of cases of uh, anti-Semitic images. Again, Holocaust memory is uh, supposed to provide us guidelines with how to deal precisely with these issues. Uh, is also giving us an opportunity to find out uh, where are the limits of uh, free speech, uh, what type of representations of the past are acceptable, what type of representations of the past are not acceptable. Now, um, as I'm going very quickly through the decades, I think you'll see that it has always been a subject of intense discussions, that the limits of representations and acceptability have shifted uh, as they very likely do. And we are in an interesting uh, situation right now where different memory demands, different memory interests are once more uh, in competition with each other and posing difficult questions to us as to the uh, recalibration of Holocaust and atrocity memories in Europe and around the world. So I wanna begin that uh, tour de force immediately in the post-war years, in the, the moment, in the months after World War II, because what's set into motion immediately is uh, a, a, a complicated process of memory, forgetting, and mediation. 
And the mediation, the visual mediation also happened immediately. Here I give you an example of the exhibit of atrocity uh, pho photography from the liberation of uh, Bergen-Belsen that were exhibited on a vast scale in the Library of Congress uh, in Washington, DC, in an effort to explain to the American population why America made the sacrifices it made uh, during World War II. So the mediation, the memory, uh, the uh, uh, attempt to explain happened immediately. Uh, in, and it led, of course, then also to interpretations and punishments of the perpetrators, for example, in the Nuremberg trial, where the new crime of crimes against humanity was defined and put into practice uh, for the first time. On the basis of that interpretation of Nazi crimes was then developed uh, the definition of genocide that is still with us today. And I'm giving you here because it's very relevant for our discussions, the definition um, of the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide here from, of course, 1948. Uh, I wanna highlight a couple of terms here. The, the definition of genocide focuses on national, ethical, racial, and religious groups, the persecution of these groups with the intention of the act of killing members of the group, uh, causing serious harm to them, deliberately trying to undermine uh, the conditions of life of these group, and um, limiting their uh, future survival uh, possibilities. That definition is going to be relevant because part of our discussion today is also if this definition is not so much a accurate, responsible response to genocide, but actually part of the problem of not having been able to respond to events like genocide appropriately, effectively in the intervening years. That's one of the, I want you to keep that question in mind. The punishment of perpetrators and the media events related to the punishment of perpetrators and the discussions continued. One of the most important uh, turning points, of course, is the Eichmann trial from 1961 uh, that has shifted, for example, Israeli society's uh, interpretation of uh, the events that the Nazis called the final solution. At that point in time, and that's important to emphasize here as well, Holocaust scholarship was almost non-existent. So while the event, the event of um, the Holocaust, not called Holocaust yet at that point in time was widely known, while it was one of the many reference points uh, of the Nuremberg trial, um, while there were attempts uh, to bring Nazi perpetrators to justice and in Nuremberg and beyond, the systematic scholarship on the basis of a huge amounts of documentation that was left behind by the Nazis had just begun, was begun by survivor groups immediately after 1945, but often uh, not paid much attention to by the rest of the world. The, one of the most important scholars, early scholars uh, of the Holocaust, Raoul Hilberg, had actually a problem getting his dissertation published. It then became one of the benchmarks of Holocaust scholarship up until this point and has been published in three editions. But it's important to realize that at the time of the Eichmann trial, Holocaust research, Holocaust historiography did only exist in marginal pockets, and the most important protagonist was Raoul Hilbert. Um, West German society also launched its own efforts to come to terms with the past by way of trials, creating a central agency to investigate Nazi trials. And one of the outcomes of that was the Auschwitz trial in Auschwitz between 1963 and 1965, which also became a site of memory and a reference point for German society. So there is in that society knowledge about the Nazi crimes and there is also in that West German society uh, a lot of hesitation to engage uh, with that past. This is always part of a media history. This is always part of also 
many artists, uh, filmmakers, television producers, trying to invent a visual language of representation uh, that does justice to the park, past and does not replicate the type of what the people, many protagonists thought at the time, the type of seductive images, the kind of seductive culture of Nazism it, itself, here, for example, represented by Leni Riefenstahl's uh, Triumph of the Will. So there was an attempt to find a visual language that is, that is different, that tries to create distance from um, the, uh, the Nazi culture. So there is a, a kind of an anti-fascism uh, in the culture going on at the same time. I gave you two, two examples very quickly. Research then uh, continued. One of the most important discussions uh, was a discussion between the so-called functionists and intentionalists about the causes of uh, the final solution, the causes of uh, the genocide of European Jewry. Um, different an idea of social history, that is that social structures played a decisive role in causing the final solution. And in, uh, by other scholars, a more conventional focus on leadership. That is that the Nazi leaders are primarily responsible and the most important causal factor that caused genocide. What changed things? What was the catalyst? The catalyst to put into existence the memory culture we know today is popular culture. It's television, what I would call the memory machine of television that actually created Holocaust memory as we know it. Um, and, and television became a fantastic machine of creating stories, um, uh, creating stories along clear narrative paths. For example, stories about heroes in World War II, stories about bystanders, about victims, and about perpetrators, relatively clear categories. And the, the media ecosystem of television is not innocent. There is a disturbing parallel, I would argue, between the television viewers of the 70s and 80s that are beginning to view the crimes of national socialism unfold on the screen again and again. There's an eerie, disturbing parallel between them and the so-called bystanders of the Nazi period itself that were, so to speak, looking at the crimes unfolding from the allegedly neutral, innocent space of their living rooms. So there's something disturbingly parallel that both facilitated and provided a safe space uh, for audiences in Europe and around the world to engage again with the Nazi crimes. From the beginning, the media event that was so decisive, we're all aware of that, is the broadcast of Holocaust in the United States in 1978, in West Germany in 1979, where it became a huge media event. And it, to this day, it's the one media event of self-reflexivity. I would say there has not been another media event, another site of memory that triggered so many self-critical, self-reflective, um, attempts to engage with a very dark past as precisely this commercially produced uh, television program. A footnote here, this uh, uh, media event was of course a media event was already uh, clearly linked to what we would call today with Michael Rothberg's terms, a multi-directional site of memory because it was the respond of, response of one American network a response to the commercial success of a mini series of another American network, and that media event was Roots. So from the beginning, there's also this interpretive link between the two events. And interesting enough, we look at the archives of German television, then one of the reasons why West German television executives decided to broadcast Holocaust was precisely the argument, we have broadcast Roots before, now we have to follow suit, and also broadcast a television miniseries that deals with our own crimes. There have been numerous artistic responses uh, to Holocaust ever since. Many filmmakers, many television executives have made their answers um, from uh, uh, the uh, Heimat, the tele another television uh, series, Landsmann's uh, Shoah, uh, Schindler's List can be uh, identified as another one. Uh, the television documentary series Holocaust by Guido Knopp 
is of, from 2000 can be named and most recently even uh, Generation of War, very successful miniseries, is a response to Holocaust, coming to terms with a media event. And at the same time, establishing a narrative paradigm for dealing, for defining and dealing with the crime of the Holocaust, beginning with a name that only became a household name as a result of the television series and was not widely used to identify the crimes beforehand. Now that narrative paradigm, for example, puts uh, an emphasis on the victims, on the figures of the victims, uh, often tells uh, stories of uh, survival and, and therefore creates a negative memory that cherishes the memory and the survival of the victims, F shifts um, focus, the focus of memory from traditional frames of heroism to new frames of remembering victimization. And that's a, that's a very big deal. That's a big deal for the shift of, um, of memory culture. Important to emphasize is that that narrative framework becomes first the official framework for recognizing and coming to terms with the crimes of the Nazi regime in West Germany. Probably the single most important moment is a speech given at the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the end of World War II by the when president of the Federal Republic, who on May 8th, 1985, in a widely recognized speech, nationally, internationally, clearly set a priority, an emphasis on the need to remember the Jewish victims uh, above uh, the German uh, dead of World War II. Subsequently, the discussion of the, the meaning of the Holocaust, and more specifically, the question of the singularity of the Holocaust, the singularity of the crimes, was vehemently discussed in the so-called historian's debate of 1986. And it is these events, the mass media events, a political re elite reacting, an intellectual relate, uh, 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 reacting that establishes the paradigm of Holocaust memory as we know it today, including the very important key um, conviction that the Holocaust is a singular event in history and should be remembered as such. This is the, the becomes the recipe, I would say first of West German collective identity and then afterwards, very uh, soon, of unified uh, Germany. Because we shouldn't forget that the Cold War ends in 1989, and then this memory first shifts from West Germany to include East Germany, at least uh, officially. It then becomes uh, the official memory of uh, the European uh, Union, which is, still is today, and also the same framework, the same narratives, the same iconography becomes the official memory of the Nazi crimes of the United Nations. The institutionalization happens in diff many, many different places around the world. One of the most important one is uh, the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., opened in 93 at the same year that Schindler's List was released. Another very important site could be named here is Yad Vashem in Israel. The stories are similar, the iconography is similar. It's a stable framework of interpretation. Now, it is only at this point in time, after uh, the Holocaust has been estab established as the benchmark of dark memory for modern history, that research about the Holocaust becomes a routine undertaking. And one of the most important uh, scholars that establishes the field is uh, Christopher Browning, uh, one of the first Im important books that uh, 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 triggered a whole wave of perpetrator research is his uh, very, very important book, Ordinary Men. Interestingly enough, one could emphasize here that as the title says, Chris Browning emphasizes the averageness uh, of the perpetrators. He has a, a very important uh, sentence 
in his book where he says, I could have been one of them because it's contextual factors that make men to perpetrators. That's one of his uh, main uh, social psychological arguments of, uh, of his book. The uh, institutionalization of Holocaust memory internationally, transnationally happened in the year 2000 in the declaration, the Stockholm Declaration of the International Forum on the Holocaust that many, many countries in the world have joined uh, by now. And that is one of the transnational uh, places of memory of uh, Holocaust history. Uh, in Germany, one of the main institutions to reflect that interpretation as a site of memory, as a site of self-critical memory, is the memorial in Berlin that opened in 2005. Now then scholarship creates uh, new interpretations. One of the most important turning points I would argue is Saul Friedlander's uh, book, The Years of Extermination from 2007, where Friedlander very successfully uh, inserts into uh, the story of the Holocaust, the perspective of the victims and where he tells a transnational history of the Holocaust, making clear how many different uh, people how many different groups of perpetrators were involved, how many different victims were caught up uh, in this uh, catastrophe uh, all across uh, Europe uh, and the world. It is the first book of scholarship that takes the perspective of the victims and puts it into that scholarship systematically and throughout uh, the book. Um, but scholarship also changes asking new questions in my view, one of the books that is already asking questions that are similar to the questions that we are discussing today is uh, Timothy Snyder's book, uh, Bloodlands from 2010, because he uh, tries to define uh, the new term, bloodlands. Um, and he's trying, he's opening up a clearly comparative vision, quite, quite different from Friedlander's vision. Friedlander's vision was very much focused on the Holocaust inserting the victims uh, into a study of the documents of the perpetrators. Now here, we have that comparative angle. We have a, a sense of, if we, especially if we're looking at Eastern Europe, if we're looking at places like Ukraine, then we realize that Stalin's crimes were at least as important as the crimes committed by the Nazis. And as a result, uh, Timothy Snyder tells us, we have different memories and different memory needs, different memory interests in different parts of the world. Um, there, is an, uh, there is in that book, I would argue, uh, perhaps not clearly acknowledged desire to put the Holocaust within a larger frame and in that sense make clear that there are other crimes that are almost on the same scale or that reach up to the same extremity of the final solution. And therefore, the book has also had um, many, uh, many critics. So the, this comparative angle becomes important, has already been raised for many years beforehand in the field of comparative genocide studies, but not in such a popular uh, publication as Bloodlands, I would argue. Another footnote we shouldn't forget, all of this is happening as memory is digitizing very rapidly, very quickly. So our memory of Nazism, of the Holocaust is now uh, driven by digital media more than ever before for new generations. Here, you know, the kind of counterfactual memory of the Third Reich in the game Wolfenstein as an example of what happened almost at the same time. Now, in order to understand the charge, the intensity of this, today's discussions, we have to include two other events. One of them is the so-called refugee crisis of 2015-16, because you could argue that refugee crisis, so-called crisis, was a test case, a test case for how good is European society in practicing what it preaches? How successful is European society in accepting the refugees? How good is it at the never again? And I think two societies in Europe have very seriously tried uh, to live up uh, to the uh, values of never again, that is Germany and Sweden. Uh, I think 
both societies uh, to different degrees have not quite succeeded in the task of integrating the refugees, but they were quite successful initially at welcoming them. But that so-called refugee crisis has caused a tremendous political backlash that was already in existence beforehand. And to understand discussions in Germany about memory and discussions about red lines with regard to memory, the next, this event is absolutely decisive. What happened in Germany is the rise of a right-wing party that uh, to this point, right-wing parties were uh, kept uh, on the margins outside of parliament. Uh, the elections of 2017 caused a, a type of political disaster. The disaster being that the right-wing party alternative for Germany is jumping into um, the parliament from zero to almost 13%. And in some parts of Germany is actually representing a plurality of the votes. And that is a, a highly problematic um, uh, experience for many people in Germany. It is also then linked and has continued during uh, the Corona crisis because many people on the right have, for example, used Holocaust symbols like the Star of David provocatively for highly problematic causes, political causes, like, for example, the denial of a Corona crisis. So it is, it is the, the perception of danger that is part of the discussion at the moment. In these, in this perceptions of danger, we are now entering the last phase, a phase of a couple of very important media events of the last years that are, again, on the background of what I have argued, make for some people, make it so adamantly important to defend a memory that has been institutionalized. And for other people, other intellectuals, uh, prompt them to argue there is something uh, problematic about that. Holocaust memory, it is not necessarily the solution, it's part of the problem. So those are the, the two sides that are now in discussion with each other, sometimes uh, directly, sometimes indirectly. Um, I want to quickly identify some of these, again, media events that were very important and that were always uh, also broadcast very broadly by social media. One of them is the discussion about Membembe in 2000. He was invited to give a keynote at, at uh, an extremely important cultural event that happens every three years. And then he was in the process of being uninvited when that event was canceled as a result of Corona. But a lot of the items that we are still discussing today and that we don't have apparently clear answers to were discussed there. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the connection of memory of the Holocaust and Israel. Uh, so one of them is the, the movement BDS, Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions, that for some people uh, has clearly uh, anti-Semitic tendencies, for others not, is a, is a legitimate criticism of Israel. His, his proximity, to, alleged proximity to that movement was one of the reasons why people in Germany called to have him uninvited. Um, Membembe also uh, raised, like many other people, the, the parallel, a comparison between the apartheid regime in South Africa and Israel as an alleged uh, apartheid state. Again, uh, often the discussions are, are now have evolved in the direction where an affiliation with BDS and the argument that Israel is an apartheid state is one of the red lines and uh, um, uh, is alleged to be implicated in anti-Semitic uh, imagery and narratives. Similar questions raised about the, the vast and very complex and diverse field of post-colonial studies of which Membembe was seen as a representative. I think he would perhaps see that differently. But all of these questions, you know, how do you deal with public speakers, public events? What are the limits of what can be said, the limits of, of freedom of expression in Germany? with regard to questions of Holocaust memory and with regard to attitudes towards Israel are very important because for many people in Germany, it is, uh, it is one of the key tasks of German society and the German state to defend Israel's right to exist. The, um, the question marks uh, quickly here about the effectiveness of Holocaust memory 
are raised by other people as well, and they are raised, for example, in the field of memory studies. And hence, I think it's very appropriate that uh, the Memory Studies Association is part uh, of uh, our event today. I want to just quickly reference a, a number of scholars. Sarah Gensberger, for example, has raised the question, is it possible that Holocaust memory uh, stipulates a completely unrealistic relationship between values and behavior? Yeah, values and the setting of values does not dominate behavior. Behavior of human beings, especially in groups, is very, very context specific. And, and therefore, we are, we are actually, uh, uh, we are conceptualizing and practicing memory in, in, in problematic ways. Leah David has raised the question, uh, our, our practices of reparations, more often than not, seem to do what we don't want to do. They seem to trigger a competition between different victims groups, and they seem to renationalize memory and therefore become part of the problem, not as the solution. Uh, Valentina Pisanti has also raised a very provocative argument in saying that a lot of our legal strategies to safeguard Holocaust memory are coming back to haunt us. Uh, for example, the European framework law that makes it illegal to deny the Holocaust has been a fantastic uh, jumping off point for the right because they could rally around those laws point towards them and say that their freedom of speech uh, has been illegally curbed. So in that sense, we seem to be uh, doing things that we don't want to accomplish by our legal frameworks of Holocaust memory. Now another, and this brings uh, the MSA in once again, another discussion more recently, 2021, was the uh, publication, was triggered by the publication of uh, Michael Rothberg's widely successful book, uh, Multidirectional Memory, which in, in memory studies, in literary studies, um, is, is one of the benchmarks of, uh, of the memory literature, has been for many, many years. Its publication in Germany triggered very critical reactions because it was read in an effort to relativize uh, Holocaust memory and therefore call into question precisely that framework that many German intellectuals and many German politicians consider so very important as an ethical grounding of German memory. And here comes the, the, the theories and the thesis that we will discuss. They, I think, link very nicely. Uh, uh, Dirk uh, Moses has managed to uh, publish back-to-back uh, -to -back two texts, very different in nature, very provocative both, uh, have caused massive discussions in uh, Europe beyond in the United States. One of them is an indictment of German memory culture. One of them is the so-called uh, catechism uh, text that argues vehemently, and he will do this, uh, explain it much better to you than I, I can, that argues this Holocaust memory, those paradigm that we have crafted is dysfunctional the way that it's practiced in Germany. Um, it, may, it has one decisive disadvantage. It doesn't allow us to deal, uh, to, to use memory in productive ways to deal with the challenge of racism and to, to invent post-colonial flexible memories that allow for Europe to become a continent of immigration. That's how I would summarize it in, in one sentence, but he will correct me. Uh, at the same time, uh, Dirk published a, a widely uh, read book, already a landmark now and similarly provocative, a book that stipulates, as I've already alluded to, that the, con that the definition of genocide, depoliticized as it is, is part of the problem and not the solution. That this genocide establishes a benchmark, an extreme benchmark of crimes against humanity and the whole time, uh, liberal as well as illiberal regimes are committing crimes against civilians on a massive scale beyond the threshold of genocide. So the, so the definition of genocide and the way that genocide is, is, uh, uh, pun is punished in practice is actually amounting to a fig leaf, allowing all kinds of power plays with a lot of civilian victims over the decades across the world and committed both by uh, totalitarian states and democratic states. Obviously, you can see that this is uh, highly uh, provocative. Uh, 
About both texts, you could argue, again, as a, in a provocative response, is Dirk perhaps uh, throwing out the babies with the bathwaters, right? Uh, is, is genocide, can we perhaps improve on genocide uh, in, in terms of its definition? Or can we perhaps also fix German memory culture? It speaks to the relevance of the book that it has already uh, triggered uh, responses in terms of books. And I want to uh, relate three arguments that are included in this recent publication, Ein Verbrechen ohne Namen, a crime without a name, in which some of the most important proponents of Holocaust memory and Holocaust scholarship um, do provide counter arguments. And very quickly, three of them. Saul Friedlander, whom we have already encountered, argues that the Holocaust is without precedent. And so to speak, this is a historical fact. And, and therefore, it is also, it's simply, it's not on the same scale as crimes against the crimes of colonialism perpetrated by European states, because the crimes of colonialism have a purpose. They're purpose oriented. Um, but the Holocaust does not have a rational purpose. And in that sense, is of a different nature, at least. Uh, Norbert Frey has argued in response to the catechism discussion that such an orthodoxy, such a belief system that is inflexible, uh, that uh, does not allow for a multiplicity of voices, does not exist in Germany, that uh, the rules um, that, that might exist for how to remember the Holocaust are a result of a complex bottom-up civil society, self-critical, emancipation from Germany's terrible past. So that, uh, that this idea that Germans follow a, set, a certain sets of rules uh, um, almost um, relentlessly and therefore create problems in terms of their the future problem, the future memory of Germany. Uh, Norbert Frey would argue that is uh, simply not reflecting the diversity, the democratic constitution of German publics. And Sibylle Steinbacher, uh, in similar ways, and Friedlander would argue that yes, of course, we can compare crimes. We compare crimes all the time. But precisely when we compare the crime of the Holocaust with other crimes, then we come to the empirical conclusion that it is a crime sui generis. That is a crime that is different from other crimes in terms of its reach, in terms of its structure, <clears throat> in terms of the criminal energy displayed by the perpetrators. So these, these are some of the counter arguments that uh, are, uh, I would say, very important, very important reference points for a lot of uh, intellectuals, uh, politicians, artists uh, in Germany and beyond. And here I want to also foreshadow uh, to our next speaker after, after our break. Uh, it's very fortuitous, very fortuitous that uh, Charlotte Wiedemann has published a book right now that tries to, I would say, square the circle. And one of the things about that book that I find deeply impressive is Charlotte's ability to find a language of moderation, a language that is uh, trying to do both things, trying to emphasize how important Holocaust memory is and should be and remains uh, in Germany, in Europe and beyond, but at the same time also tries to open the discussion, opens memory cultures in Germany and beyond to the ability to taking on board, to recognizing the suffering of so many other constituencies around the world that until this point in time have not received sufficient attention and recognition in Europe, in Germany and beyond. So it is precisely a way to navigate and find a compromise in this uh, very, very complex uh, memory terrain. I want to end this uh, ambitious contextualization with a set of very straightforward questions that I have also shared with the other speakers. One of them is, of course, what is the problem with Holocaust memory? Uh, can it be fixed? Or has it, does it have to be replaced? And if so, with what? Uh, then more to the point of genocide studies, uh, what can the uh, definition of genocide perhaps be amended so that it is much more functional than it seems to be now? For example, by recognizing also crimes against political groups. 
Um, and how do we respond to one of the key theses that uh, uh, Dirk will also explain to you, his, his idea that the problem is that all kinds of states and societies insist on absolute permanent security for themselves. And in insisting on absolute permanent security, they are committing crimes again and again and again. Question is, how can that idea if it's true, how can it be cast into an effective legal social response against the commitment of crimes against civilians? And finally, this is more like a historical footnote for the historians. Um, is it really true that, for example, the Nazi perpetrators were driven by security concerns? Weren't there a lot of other motives, uh, some of them perhaps more important motives, for example, that already very pedestrian motives that Chris Browning has already identified to us in the 1990s. So with these uh, guiding questions, uh, we'll see uh, what kind of answers we think. I turn over uh, the word to Dirk for his uh, lecture, uh, and then we go into a break, then we talk to Charlotte, and then we talk to all of you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Wolf Kunsteiner, for the for this uh, magisterial overview and introduction, and of course for the invitation to be with you here in uh, this fantastic university, the University of Aarhus, where I've now spent um, three or four very pleasant and interesting days. Uh, I'm also very grateful um, that the important uh, German journalist and intellectual Charlotte Wiedermann is joining us uh, from Berlin. It's a pity she can't be here in person, but uh, she's here on Zoom. And that means um, that uh, we can have a, I think, a very well informed and well rounded discussion. So I'm going to be uh, working through quite a few PowerPoints in the same way that Wolf Kunsteiner did, though mine are branded with the City College of New York the logo, uh, which uh, we will have to do these days. Now, what was the problem that I observed that needed addressing? You know, why did I intervene in the German debate? Why did I write this book on the history of the genocide concept? Well, regarding the German context, I observed over the last few years, case after case of public shaming and cleansing of people out of public life, which ended people's careers and excluded outsiders particularly non-whites and progressive Jews uh, living in Germany and those outside Germany. I also observed uh, non-Jewish Germans, uh, the vast majority of the population, lecturing progressive Jews about Holocaust memory. Now, once you see that, then you start scratching your head and you think, how did we get to this point where in a good conscience, with good intentions, Germans are lecturing Jews and uh, non-whites like uh, Achille Mbembe from Africa uh, about how to remember the Holocaust, how to relate it to other crimes in world history. Uh, there was a particular chutzpah here at work, and I became curious about its origins as well as uh, nervous about its effects. Now, we've already seen pictures uh, to this effect from Wolf Kunsteiner, so I won't, uh, I won't repeat it. But what I also observed was an intense identification uh, with the state of Israel by the German political class. Uh, German politicians and administrators never missed an opportunity to get a photograph uh, with the Israeli ambassador, uh, to put an Israeli flag on their building that uh, their, their ministry was uh, housed in and so forth. Um, and I didn't see this kind of solidarity with Palestinian society, which was uh, being bombed and, and uh, its land being taken away and so forth. I also absorbed at the same time a considerable and growing Islamophobia, in part because of the rise of this far right party mentioned by Wolf Kunsteiner, the RFD, but also in the German mainstream. So on the top right here, we have a screenshot from Twitter where some clever person says, uh, guess where this is? Is this Berlin or Gaza? Uh, it's in it's in Berlin. It's in uh, Zonnenale, Berlin. It's actually a cafe I've walked by myself many times um, with the Palestinian flag there. But you know the point he's making is that you know there's this dangerous uh, terrorist-ridden uh, uh, enclave 
like Gaza in Berlin itself. Right? So it's highly problematic. It, sur it securitizes and racializes an immigrant population in Berlin in a highly dubious manner. Now, uh, more subtle, but I think equally problematic, is this quote by a, 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 a journalist who's actually written quite a positive review of the Documenta, that art exhibition that's going on in Kassel at the moment, uh, where, where they say that they were surprised, pleasantly surprised, to see that despite the allegations of BDS, which they call a radical Israel critical movement, which is always the prefix to talk about Hamas, so they're kind of conflating a non-violent boycott movement with a terrorist organization, um, that they said despite this uh, whiff of BDS at the documenta, they didn't see a exterminatory intention anywhere in the exhibition. So it kind of surprised them. But my question is, why would you expect that? I mean, what, what fantasy do you have in your head of, of uh, nonviolent Palestinian advocacy? Clearly a terroristic one. And that was, I think, uh, quite telling about the way these things are uh, imagined in German public debate. Now, much of this is re was driven by, but also reflected by a German parliamentary resolution in 2019, which condemned BDS as anti-Semitic. This is a kind of fatwa, frankly, which is not actually a law, it's just a resolution, but operates to determine policy in the German ministries, uh, especially those that uh, give funds to the cultural sector, museums, art exhibitions, and so forth. Uh, and, and that means that uh, invitation lists of these kinds of events are screened, a, a social media screening is undertaken, to see that any invited artist from the global south or anywhere really has not tweeted or put something on Instagram, which might be critical of Israel. And if they have, then they're not invited to Germany. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's what's going on in Germany. And unless you follow these things closely, uh, you, don't, you don't really realize how repressive the atmosphere has come, become. Uh, I wrote an article about this called uh, Effective Colonization. Um, uh, which is the, the, the aspiration of the German political class to retrain the emotions of Muslim, Arab, particularly Palestinian migrants, um, so that they feel German uh, and not just think German, actually in their emotional reactions, their affects, experience reality as Germans. And that means, according to Felix Klein, who is the German uh, Commissar for anti-Semitism, that is for the but watching out for anti-Semitism. Um, as he says in this little video clip, which is in this tweet, he says, Palestinian kids, young Palestinians who want to become German citizens can attest to their integration by subscribing to the Israeli interpretation of the founding of the state of Israel in 1948, which of course entailed the expulsion and flight of about 700,000 Palestinians. In other words, the you have to ask yourself, why are there Palestinians in Germany at all? You know, why aren't they living in Palestine or Israel? Well, it was because their parents are refugees or their grandparents, right? But you have to accept the Israeli view of these things. That is just bad luck. And you know this was necessary for the founding of Israel. And you have to forget your own refugee history in order to be properly German. Now, when I saw that, I, I couldn't quite believe it. I thought this is an unreasonable demand for migrants. And um, I think it needs to be uh, called into question. Now, of course, Palestinians are well aware of what's going on. So uh, from one, uh, one newspaper website, I, I saw this article, you know, Germany is projecting its Holocaust guilt onto Palestinians. I don't want to get into this now. I just want to sort of give you a sense of uh, the lay of the land. And now it has led also to a discourse in, in confronting anti-Semitism where everybody becomes a possible Nazi. So here is a, uh, a poster which was uh, quickly withdrawn after considerable protest, where it's a competition in May last year, uh, sorry, May this year, uh, where we're looking for the anti-Semite of the year. Okay, If you look closely at the, and we'll send them into the desert, that's that says, once we find them, we'll send them to the desert. If you look at the back of the donkey, it includes Amnesty International, along with the Judenstern, with the Jewish star uh, from the Nazi period, as with BDS. So it's actually saying, that they're all akin to Nazis, Amnesty International, because of its report on apartheid in Israel. I think that's why. Um, and if you look at the bottom left, the sponsors are actually major state institutions in Berlin. And the tweet says, which accompanied this, it says, 
uh, let's make a sign against anti-Semitism. Uh, and then it mentions the jury. And then we can send them into the desert, whoever is a judge to be the anti-Semite of the year. There was considerable complaint about this and it was pulled, but I did get a screenshot of it first. So we can see the kind of demented dimensions that this hunt for anti-Semites in the name of Holocaust memory has led. Now, uh, related to all this is a general attack on the German cultural scene because of this BDS resolution, anti-BDS resolution. This is an article from Die Welt from last year, which is a diatribe against Bonaventura, a famous, uh, an important uh, uh, figure in the museum and art scene in Berlin, who was uh, elected last year to be the next leader of the, or director of the Haus der Kulturen der Welt, an important cultural institution in Berlin, like the big time, which gets lots of uh, government money. And uh, it it's a preemptive strike uh, on his reputation. And it's full of suggestions that he might be in favor of BDS. There's actually no evidence that he is, but there's all these insinuations. And uh, the idea is that we can clamp down on this government funding for the cultural scene, uh, because in the cultural scene, you have all these dark people like him who um, might not be on the party line in this hurrah for Israel, uh, mode that you saw in those tweets that I showed you a few minutes ago, you know, with the Israeli flag and and uh, uh, Israeli politicians and so forth. Uh, and this is an ongoing campaign. Now, in response to all this, uh, and cases like it, though some of these uh, cases have have uh, uh, occurred since I wrote my article. I, I did publish this piece in May last year in English and in German, and I think there's now a version in Arabic called "The Catechism of the Germans," which is somewhat inflammatory title I read because uh, a, uh, a German uh, literary figure published an essay of the, of the same uh, type, same title uh, uh, over 200 years ago, which was an ultra nationalist text against the French occupation. And uh, there is a suggestion here that this is a kind of uh, post national nationalism that you have in Germany, uh, which has uh, leads to this illiberalism that I'm identifying in these cases I've just shared with you. And the catechism has five elements, okay? The Holocaust is, is considered unique because it was the unlimited destruction of Jews for the sake of it as an end in itself, rather than, you know, in order to, to put down a rebellion or to take people's land. It was an, it's driven by myth and ideology and, and pure hatred rather than for pragmatic material reasons. It was a spiritual event, if you like, for the Nazis, rather than uh, a profane or pragmatic one. And the second point, it was thus a, uh, a breach of, of civilizational norms and becomes the moral foundation of uh, refoundation of Germany and indeed of the European Union. Uh, and uh, in, to some extent, global society, you'll recall the slide by Wolf Kunsteiner on the Stockholm Forum from the year 2000, so not far from here. Um, which does talk about the Holocaust being a singular rupture in Western civilizational norms. And you know, by recognizing that, we can sort of reconstitute European morality. Okay. Now, as a result of the first two, Germany has a special responsibility uh, to Jews in Germany, which I support 100%, mind you. Um, and also, in addition to this, a special loyalty uh, to Israel and uh, the security of Israel becomes part of Germany's reason of state, Staatsraison, which was uh, uttered by Angela Merkel, the former chancellor, when she visited Germany, I think in 2005, six or seven, around then. In addition to that, anti-Semitism is considered a distinct prejudice and, and this needs to be elaborated, in its version of redemptive anti-Semitism, the Nazi version, which Charles Friedlander famously expressed, uh, is a bit distinctly German mode of, of anti-Semitism, the, the Nazi version, right? And the final one is that anti-Semitism is, uh, is anti-Zionism, okay? So I, I noticed that in, when anyone violated any of these five articles of the catechism, they were subject to the kind of mobbing that I was talking about in the previous slides. It was a sort of an empirical observation over the years. And I decided to like, let's systematize this. And it works as kind of a political religion. I decided to use this, you know, clearly Christian uh, term because a catechism is a Catholic, particularly Catholic no, mode of uh, thinking. Uh, it's because religious tropes saturate German discussion, collective guilt, sin, the mark of Cain, uh, lots, lots of religious imagery once you sort of start 
looking carefully at the, the way people talk about the Holocaust. This is not a criticism on my part, it's just an observation, right? Um, and many scholars have observed this political religious elements of this in the past. It's not well known in, among journalists, but if you know, there's an extensive scholarly literature out there, which I've contributed to in a book, in fact, 15 years ago. I also observe, and this is a second point, that provocatively, uh, a, a priestly class of German politicians, journalists, and unfortunately, even some academics, who try to enforce conformity by engaging in these excommunication rituals and witch hunts, which I've been talking about, and I'll give you some more examples. Uh, Norbert Frey, who was quoted at the end by Burkina, says, no, no, this is a civil society-led movement from below. Well, that was true for the 1980s, but it's changed. And he's actually one of the people who in engage in this kind of excommunication rituals, because rather than just engage in debate with me, they then, they then cast aspersions and insinuate very nasty things to, in order to discredit opponents morally rather than intellectually. Okay. Now, uh, there are precedents to this language that I used. Exactly a year before my article, uh, Stefan Dertjen, uh, who's written this article here on the left, uh, used exactly the same terminology. Uh, I'll just translate this. He says, um, political state, reason of state becomes a civil religion and the anti-Semitism commissioner becomes its high priest. Uh, the historiographically uh, grounded belief in the uniqueness of the Holocaust transforms into a doctrinaire uh, belief uh, that with state authority is defended against you know heretical questioning uh, as if it as if the state is uh, uh, managing the spiritual property of the Bundesrepublik of the Federal Republic of Germany that's a quote from his article in a sense I was very much elaborating this insight although I actually not read his article it was only discovered it afterwards but we sort of came to the same conclusion. So I wanted to honor his precedent in uh, a year earlier. Now, why all this dogmatism? Uh, why these problems that I refer to? Now here I want to uh, not wag my finger disapprovingly, but as a, as a social scientist, try to understand like, how did we get here? You know? Well, I'm gonna sort of summarize you know, quite a lot of thinking and literature in a couple of sentences, right? Uh, and, and happily, we've had a very good introduction to this via uh, Wolf Kunstein's presentation before mine. We're dealing here, of course, with a post-Holocaust perpetrator society, uh, in of which whose members, many of whose members are trying to do the right thing, especially since the 1980s. And those speeches that were mentioned in the German parliament, uh, these historians dispute, and also a, a civil society-led movement in the 1980s who try to remember the victims in their villages and in their towns. Like what happened to the synagogue in our town? Where did it go? Oh, there's a supermarket on it now. Well, let's put up a, a monument or let's, let's put down Stolpersteine, uh, which are the stumbling stones as they're called, uh, in front of buildings where Jews lived and were deported from. And they're all through Berlin and many other German cities now. I think this is a very important innovation and development in German memory culture. And at that moment in the 1980s and 90s, worked in tandem with multiculturalism, uh, which was sort of developing as an ideal in Germany, because you still had a pretty conservative section of the political class, which insisted that Germany is not a migration society and that um, eventually all these Turks and Arabs should go home and so forth. Uh, and the impulse here was that never again should we allow something like national socialism on our a watch, and uh, this was this worked positively because in the 1980s and even into the 90s, there still were remnants of the authoritarian thinking that had led to the not the Holocaust and Nazi regime. Uh, they they've gone now for very generational and other reasons, but there was a there was a very positive bottom up movement, okay, that worked in tandem with you know the intellect parts of the intellectual elites these historians and other social scientists and the progressive wing of the political class, okay? However, in part two, uh, by the time you get to the 2000s, this uh, culture from below becomes verstaatlicht, the Germans say, it becomes, I don't know if there's an equivalent word in, in Danish, but it becomes official state policy. And now you get the enforcement of conformity from above rather than it percolating up from below. 
So you lead to it, you lead to a kind of tragic situation where in the effort to work through the past, um, you get the repetition of the German authoritarian traditions that it's trying to overcome. It's kind of a dialectical relationship, especially the notion of cleansing culture. You're always on the lookout for anti-Semites. Uh, and you can see how that can go off the rails in some of the examples uh, that I've gotten, that I've given you. And you end up producing quite a lot of moralistic bullies who are trying to destroy people's careers with a good conscience. German public life is riddled with these kinds of people, but they can't really understand what they're doing because they are, in fact, I think in many cases, driven by a good conscience. Uh, so there is a tragic element to this. You know, I'm not here trying to tear people down. I'm standing outside looking into the goldfish bowl of 80 million people and thinking, what? how did they get themselves into this mess? Now, it's partly, I think, the, the tragic situation of a in, in, it's a perhaps unavoidable situation of a, of a post-Holocaust perpetrator society that is sincerely trying to overcome the Nazi past. You know, once the civic culture of memory becomes official state policy and you appoint officials, officials to, you know, and anti-Semitism, and they, that's their job, they go looking around for it everywhere. And once you combine that with an increasingly diverse society, especially of migrants and refugees from the Middle East, you end up territorializing the Palestine-Israel situation into Germany itself. And the Palestinians are then coded as uh, latter-day Nazis who have imported anti-Semitism and so forth. Uh, so I think that's uh, uh, a, a very brief summary of how we got to this uh, dogmatic situation. Now, the first article of the catechism is Holocaust uniqueness. Now, this has led to apoplexy about the colonial frame in Holocaust, especially in genocide studies, which I've contributed to. Uh, the argument against this is that, you know, the Holocaust is central, sorry, anti-Semitism is central to the Holocaust, not imperial expansion or colonial racism. We need to keep those separate. Um, the second thing, in response, there's no such thing as Israeli settler colonialism, uh, although these very same people will say we're against the settlements. Uh, they don't, there's kind of a cognitive dissonance there. And the third point is to insist that Jews are not white. Now, I don't want to get into the rights and wrongs of these things now. I'm just laying out the structure of the debate, okay? Now, part of this uh, debate, and this now links back to my, my book, is the, this distinction that Wolf Kunsteiner made uh, or presented that the logic of the Holocaust is very different to the logic of other genocides and certainly other crimes against humanity. There's a unique intention to destroy all Jews in the world uh, in a kind of redemptive effort to rescue Germany from, uh, from Jewish domination. Uh, now, in response to, well, in, in consistent with that, one historian, uh, Gertz Ali, when someone pointed out, but what about the genocide of the Herero Nama in German Southwest Africa before the First World War, he said, well, look, you know, that was a that was das war Gegenwehr. That's, that was self-defense by the colonial uh, troops against the rebellion. There was an actual rebellion by the uh, Herrera and Nama, and therefore they were exterminated by partly repressing them in a, in a war, in a military encounter, and then pushing the civilian population into the desert and not letting them back in so they would uh, perish there, which they did in their tens of thousands. Now, you know, I, uh, I was troubled by that. And uh, in fact, that was the issue that I've been trying to work out in, in my book uh, over the last 10 or 15 years. And I, I came to the conclusion that there is actually a link between the Holocaust and these uh, cases of colonial genocide, uh, because all genocidal perpetrators, when you study their paranoid intentions and, and mentality, they all think they're acting in self-defense. They all think they're dealing uh, with Gegenwehr, you know, against a uh, colonial uprising. But it took me a while to figure out we need to distinguish between modalities of security. There is every state, like any individual, has a right to some basic security, right? But permanent security is a deeply utopian and sinister aspiration. It's the idea to be safe and secure within your state borders, uh, if, whether perhaps expanded borders, forever, for all time, okay? Uh, which necessarily leads to state violent excesses, okay? 
It's about eliminating future threats. So never again can a population group like, say, the Herero threaten our racial utopia, say, in German South West Africa, of a white settler colony. Okay. Uh, so as I say, there, you know, all genocides uh, share this logic of preventative and anticipatory security paranoia. And all genocidal perpetrators believe they're engaging in self-defense. Now, you know who helped me link it to the Holocaust? It was Saul Friedlander in the same book that Wolf Kunsteiner mentioned. And here on page 557, he writes, the Nazis regarded Jews as an active threat, and he italicizes that. They're his italics for all Aryan humanity in the long run and in the immediate future for a Reich embroiled in a world war, meaning that the Jews had to be exterminated before they could harm Fortress Europe from within or join forces with the enemy coalition they had themselves set against the Reich. Now, this logic uh, pertains to all genocides. Now, some would say, well, you know, there was, however, an actual uprising in German Southwest Africa and Jews weren't engaged in an uprising against the Nazis. It's true. But of course, it's about anticipation. It's about what might happen. Right? They, and the Nazis feared that there would be a collapse of the home front as there was at the end of the First World War, when you had a general strike, well, many strikes, and the liberal press uh, was asking for peace conditions with the, uh, with the Allies, so 1918, 1917-18, and so forth. Uh, and, and the German right, among them the Nazis, in the 20s blamed, blamed this coalition between liberals and leftists in the labor movement for the loss of the First World War. It's called the stab in the back. So they wanted to prevent another stab in the back by locking up leftists and Jews because they regarded Jews as allied, allied with the left, which was a common prejudice throughout uh, Europe at the time. So I thought what you can do is actually put all genocides in the same frame. Now, in doing so, we can start to see crimes in a slightly different way. Here is a image from the wonderful provocative Yemeni street artist Murad Zubay, whose website I put there and I encourage you to look at it, uh, which I looked at when I was trying to find a cover for my book. Here is a, a picture of a, a bombed building destroyed by Saudi ordinance funded by my taxpayers money in America, not an American citizen, but I pay tax because the arms come from the US and from Britain mainly, possibly Germany, I'm not sure. Um, and at the back of the room, he's painted an image of the family that was killed in that room. Uh, that's why the, the picture is called Family Portrait. And he's put a raven ominously on top in order to indicate their terrible fate. Now, I put that on the cover of my book because I, I wanted to remind people, why don't we see these kind of victims as equally worthy of our attention uh, as victims of genocide, because they're not victims of genocide. They're, victim, they're collateral victims in a semi-international armed conflict uh, who receive no attention at all. Although uh, the war in and around Yemen, about Yemen, is one of the most destructive conflicts of the last 10 years. But because it doesn't fit the genocide optic, it's much more messy, multi-directional war, uh, it doesn't get the attention that I think it should. And we don't see these kinds of victims. However, from one perspective, they can be seen as victims of permanent security imperatives of the Saudis, uh, who fear, uh, fear an Iranian proxy regime nearby, uh, which is really what's going on there to some extent. Uh, and, you know, once we change our optic about who qualifies as a victim, uh, then we can begin to see many other conflicts as problematic, uh, but are normalized and not rend rendered legible to us as problematic because we fixate on genocide as the crime of crimes and genocide is modeled on the Holocaust. The Holocaust is its archetype, okay? Now, I'm not gonna go into detail about this. You have to read my book. It's only 500 pages plus a hundred page index. So uh, we don't have time, but that's the basic intention. I didn't write it though for the German market where no one's willing to translate it, incidentally, but, uh, but for more, more general market. Now, there is political debate in Germany right now on the other articles of the catechism. Uh, the third one, you recall, is Germany's special responsibility uh, to Israel, uh, which I see as being Germany and Israel are conceived for the German political class as sort of one single political space, uh, which we might talk about in the discussion. 
Uh, Anti-Semitism, you recall, is a distinct prejudice and can't be confused with racism generally. So this means that one can be an anti-anti-Semite, so oppose anti-Semitism, but also be a racist. And I think we're seeing quite a few examples of that. And the fifth one that, and this is very uh, uh, current, is that anti-Semitism is equated with Zionism, anti-Zionism. So the current equations you see are, you know, post-colonialism is anti-Zionism. It's the same as woke anti-Semitism, okay? Uh, and post-colonialism is tantamount to people from outside Europe, the global south, non-white. They're likely to be pro-BDS, so they're inveterate anti-Semites. And we'll see that this uh, logic and syllogism uh, comes to play in the documenta debate. Now, how do you enforce the catechism? Well, what you do, uh, in my observation, is that you discredit, you try to discredit the messenger, people like me uh, and, and Bembe, Michael Rothberg, uh, many, in, many people within Germany, by creating facts, you make up quotes, you distort their views, uh, they're denounced as being like the far right, although we're on the opposite sides of the spectrum. Um, you denounce them as anti-Semites through innuendo. Uh, this will usually start somewhere deep in the internet, you know, on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. And then a newspaper picks it up and says, aha, we, they smell blood in the water. There's a scandal that we can hype up, you know, and that might sell a few, few more of our newspapers about because our subscriptions are lagging a bit. So this is how allegations from the shadow region end up in the mainstream. And there are many examples, uh, which we may talk about later. Uh, as a result, once the newspaper said, you know, writes about it, then politicians and cultural organizations about whom the allegations are leveled have forced to take a stand. And of course, they always have to say, we're against anti-Semitism which I support incidentally, uh, but that leads then to serial uh, cancellations. So you lead, you end up in what I would call a German psychodrama where there's incredible outrage about perceptions of taboo breaches <laughs> rather than the subject about which uh, the, the breach is dis to be discussed. For example, someone says something about Israel, people, how dare you? We end up talking about the how dare you instead of what is actually going on on the ground, okay? Now, uh, let's give this to give you some examples. In autumn last year, uh, the, uh, the, the Palestinian journal, uh, German journalist Nimi Al Hassan was invited by an important German network to run a science show, so very unpolitical. And a, a German uh, bloggers and then uh, uh, a German newspaper uh, dug up old photos of her where she used to wear a hijab and she'd liked some uh, critical things about Israel on, on, on Instagram and uh, was eventually fired. But you need to look at the, what it says here. It says, this is uh, the one on the left. This is what a radical Islamist uh, looks like when she, when she, as a Unterwander, when she sneaks into the German mainstream. She's actually the person in the middle, but she's trying to look Western and sneak into our culture and, and undermine it from within. So once she was sacked, Junge Freiheit, so the AFD newspaper says, we did it, geschafft. Our protests uh, worked. The AFD works. Uh, vote, vote for us in the in the next election, and uh, we will sweep out the rest of them. So it's deeply problematic, racist, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, hetz propaganda. Many other examples. Here's a Palestinian uh, academic who was disinvited after being on the program of a Viennese uh, conference, actually on post-colonialism, because uh, some people complained about her abstract. Uh, which was quite exacting, as you'd expect from someone uh, from Palestine itself, and they kicked her out. Uh, in this case as well, the Goethe Institute disinvited the very important uh, Palestinian intellectual and uh, activist Mohammed el Kurd. They say on the far right, you know, the Goethe Institute decided that Mohammed el Kurd was not an appropriate speaker for this forum, et cetera, et cetera. It was disinvited. This case after case that like this can be. Uh, Dissert. Now, if they can't disinvite someone, uh, then they'll smear them with gaslighting. For example, Tariq Bakoni, who's a, a, a Palestinian uh, uh, intellectual and uh, uh, you know analyst, he used to work for International Crisis Group, you know, with a PhD from King's College London. He's denounced just as an activist, uh, and at the hijacking memory conference, he's misquoted as saying the Holocaust is a Jewish psychodrama, which he never said. He was, he was denounced for saying that the Israelis are child murdering. He never said these things. 
So, uh, but you know, once they appear in the press somewhere, they just get requoted, uh, and and then his reputation is destroyed, at least in Germany, as a way of also attacking this conference. Okay. So once again, the outcome is instead of talking about the occupation, which is what he was talking about, we're talking about sort of turns of phrase that he didn't actually even use. So I call this the German psychodrama, which leads us to uh, the regrettable appearance of uh, Abbas a week or so ago in, in Berlin that Wolf Kahnstein uh, led with, where it says here, you know, he relativizes the Holocaust and outrageously Schultz says nothing. Uh, I think Schultz, at the time, Schultz, I think, was so shocked he didn't know what to do. He issued a press release and a tweet soon after where he, he condemned it. Uh, but you get, uh, the, what's the Palestinian view of this? Look at Marianne Boguti. She says, Mahmoud Abbas, drawing uh, from Holocaust memory to highlight current Palestinian reality, was the last resort to explain our ethnic cleansing today. The new image of dead bodies every morning is clearly not enough to see the horror. So he employed the Holocaust. Uh, and then she, she, she goes on. The thread is actually much longer. But she says here, yeah, well, he, it would be good to prosecute him. But for other things like the authoritarian rule of the Palestinian administration, authority, complicity, you know. So Palestinian civil society is actually very, very much against uh, his rule and the Palestinian authorities' uh, uh, administration, which they see as complicit in the occupation. Um, but uh, in terms of the German psychodrama, you know, uh, I, first of all, don't want to endorse what he said, uh, but we could talk about it uh, afterwards. Uh, but instead of talk, talking about the massacres that he was referring to of Palestinians from the 40s until today, there was a, uh, a, a German hysteria about the fact that he equated the Palestinian experience with the Holocaust in a, in a somewhat flippant way. Now, uh, a day later, a day or two later, many of you may know that the Israeli authorities and forces ra uh, raided five or six uh, Palestinian NGOs uh, in um, in parts of uh, occupied Palestine and East Jerusalem, uh, which is also part of that, I guess, that's disputed. Um, and all you got in comparison was uh, uh, European states, including the German one, issuing a press release saying that, you know, they're deeply concerned. Uh, they did say that it's uh, absolute unhinem, un utterly unacceptable, but the tone is much more moderate than uh, the, the hysteria about what Abbas said, okay? I have to say that the, the German government's reaction, you know, in, in these official texts is actually probably all you can expect from them, but the, it's the journalists. The journalists don't, are not uninterested in this, okay? It's about the public sphere, okay? Uh, commented on the left here by uh, Medico International, a German NGO that works there. They're actually having a... Uh, at, at 7.30 tonight, they're actually having a, an online uh, forum about this case. Um, no one believes that these, these Palestinian civil society groups are involved in terrorism. This was already dealt with late last year when the, uh, they were first attacked by Israeli authorities. But the, the point I'm making now is not to get into the details, but the different kind of media reaction. So there's hysteria about Abbas's stupid statement, but there's basically radio silence uh, on the, on an actual attack on civil society groups that, if they occurred in Russia or in Hungary, uh, would lead to you know quite a lot of media attention here. I would think. Now, I, how am I doing for time? I might press on a bit. Okay. Now, just to give you an example of how the smear campaigns were documented, this was uh, just a Facebook group, probably just two or three members that started uh, earlier this year ins insinuating that Documenta was anti-Semitic and uh, before the, it had even opened, right? no one knew it was in there. Uh, and that led to, uh, just before it opened uh, a few months ago, people, and we don't know who, screening onto the main building, these in, in the sort of script that often used by the Nazis, this text saying, this is like the Documenta 1933. In other words, this is like a Nazi Documenta. Juden nicht erwünscht, like Jews are not welcome here, and so forth. Quite extraordinary. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, on this banner that which has now been taken down, there was an anti-Semitic image. One, okay, and I wrote an article about it, quite critical of the group uh, that did it, Taring Party. Uh, that's it there, the screenshot of the front page of the article. Uh, I won't repeat. I don't need to repeat that image because it, it was in Wolf's um, uh, 
uh, PowerPoints, but it's led to a kind of a, a frenzy of, of uh, about the documenta in order to see that, you know, there's no anti-Semitic images and a lot of it is just wrong. So here, for example, is a tweet saying, um, here's a caricature of a, of a Jew in order to hide it, Taring Party changed the, changed the hats. So it didn't look like a kippah. So you can see um, the figure on the left, he has on the one, the left in both pictures. On the right, he has what looks like a kippah. On the left, then they put a um, more Muslim looking hat. Uh, and they, they said, aha, we caught you. But I then asked a, uh, an actual expert on this. I tweeted this. You know, there are other images like it. I asked, uh, like the one here, if you look at the images on the bicycle on the right, it's a similar picture, a big nose and so forth, right? I asked an Indonesia art expert, Adrian Vickers, who teaches at the University of Sydney, and I know him because I used to work at the University of Sydney. You know, one of the wonderful things about universities is that they're intellectual communities where you're surrounded by people who just know stuff about things you don't know. And uh, sometimes you can ask them, you go, look, uh, Adrian, is that an anti-Semitic figure on the right? I mean, you know, if this was a European image, not an Indonesian one, you know, we would be wondering. He says, no, no, they are both standard clowns from the Wei Wang centuries old. It has nothing to do with Jews. Uh, I pointed that out and uh, the, the, you know, I said on Twitter, I said, I think you guys need to withdraw this. There was even a newspaper article which picked this up. And uh, they just stopped, you know, that, that is, they, they contested it. Uh, no, no, this must, be, this must be a Jew. I don't care what the experts say. Uh, and then the line went dry on the Twitter thread, but they didn't take it down. It's still up there. Now, in the meantime, some art historians have actually gotten involved and said the same thing. And they say here, to incriminate pictures without giving a second thought to their content and context is nothing but embarrassing ignorance, okay? Uh, another another art historian uh, in relation to other pictures, which someone on the left says, the major intellectual and the major journalist in Germany said, more anti-Semitism at the documenta because of these images that come from an Algerian artist, actually, but about the first intifada in the late 80s. And uh, this, this, this scholar on the right, uh, he, he actually says uh, that they are actually driven they're actually goya motifs he's riffing goya there's nothing to do with jews and i'm not going to do the whole quote here but he says uh, you know to sort of jump in like this and to and to suggest that there's anti-semitism when in fact they're not is totalitarian thinking because it's insisting that people have the right well the germans say gesinnung the right interior orientation uh which is that which is not part of a liberal society it's actually what totalitarian society demands I'm finishing soon. Now, at the same time, uh, various uh, people like you know, a friend of mine, Yossi Batal, who's an Israeli uh, living in Berlin, has pointed out, you know, while this is going on, there's this, this feeding frenzy about the documenta based on ignorance, right? You actually have lots of racist imagery around Germany. So here we have these figures are near the coffee machine in Karstadt and Hermannplatz in Berlin, you know, but let's not talk, let's talk about Indonesian art, you know, <laughs> and then this other guy says, look, here are the um, here are these three black figures in in uh, a Marzi pan shop in Lubeck. Like, but you know, let's not talk about that. You know, let's talk about these Indonesian artists. Now, this asymmetry in in public attention about racism versus anti-Semitism is all the more chilling, given that uh, the last few days, in fact, today, the last these pogroms went for two three days, the twenty second of. Uh, of August to the 24th of August, 92, in Rostock, uh, a program involving thousands of people against uh, refugees, including Vietnamese refugees, as you can see in this article from the Frankfurter Rundschau, is, is being remembered. Now, there has been some press attention to this, like this article, but, you know, it's pretty muted, given how shocking this violence was, okay? Uh, and this is a lived reality for many people of what Germans call migration background in Germany. And they're, they're, you don't get the same cleansing impulses there to root out racism now you are slowly i think uh, and it's a very good thing decolonizing the streetscape in berlin for example replacing the street names of you know uh german vic colonial victories like maji maji was probably genocidal uh and german colonial heroes with with other names more appropriate names now, I don't think this is the same kind of thing because changing public space, which is supposed to be democratically constituted, is very different from art, you know, which has its own in, interior logic of freedom. Uh, 
uh, and the most most current uh, and ongoing hysteria is about this is uh, Karl May. Uh, a new movie has come out uh, with an accompanying book. Uh, he's, a, he's a beloved um, German author from a long time ago about uh, the Wild West in America, right? cowboys and Indian stuff, where uh, a German, after some complaints, the German publisher has withdrawn the book for this film. And this German politician says, oh, it's uh, it's regrettable and uh, a regrettable and false decision uh, to not deliver this book. Uh, you know, hurt feelings uh, can be, make for a good controversy, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this very same politician said just before, you know, uh, art can be art, uh, political, but um, anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic stereotypes are not political, but, but are, you know, uh, hostile to humanity. So that's not, you know, kind of anti-Semitism, but uh, sort of, you know, racist stereotypes, that's okay. And uh, uh, Jürgen Simmerer in the bottom right there, in uh, who's a, a very important historian of colonial Africa and has been leading the charge on, on, uh, on these issues, says this is, a, this is a regrettable and false tweet. It's not about hurt feelings, but about the reproduction of racist and colonial stereotypes it's a pity that uh, this this uh, uh, education politician doesn't understand that. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think uh, now we have ten minute break, uh, and then we uh, we gather together again for kind of this uh, response uh, slash presentation. Thank you very much, guys. I'll we'll see you back online in 10 minutes. Uh, without much uh, ado, because we're already a little bit behind schedule, I'm, uh, I'm giving the word to Charlotte Friedemann. Uh, as I already uh, said in my presentation, we'd be lucky to have her here because she is speaking with her words, her publications uh, in Germany, also, especially with her new book, precisely to the problem that we're dealing with here. That is, the apparently competitive relationship between Holocaust memory on the one hand and memories concerned with post colonialism in many in different ways on the other hand, and how that uh, circle could possibly be squared. So, we are hoping for a very productive and constructive uh, feedback and discussion between her and uh, Dick. Uh, Charlotte, without further words, I give the floor to you. So, good afternoon to everybody. Um, thank you for having me. And um, as I jumped in on short notice, I don't have a presentation in this professional way. I will just talk. So it's a paper in the traditional sense of the word. And um, it's, of course, a fascinating task to respond to Dirk, um, who is not listening to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's a fascinating task. So to respond to Dirk, um, particularly as my response will be a melange of um, dissent, even some degree of disapproval, and on the other side, um, strong consent and approval. And maybe this kind of melange is already something good as such, since I think nothing is more urgent than to overcome the negative energy of hostile and fruitless debates. So I strongly advocate that memory culture should be discussed in an atmosphere of intellectual freedom, civic spirit, and maybe also even some tenderness. I think we owe this in respect to all the pain and suffering behind the abstract term of memory. I'm also convicted that controversial and divisive issues in memory culture should be treated much more as a matter of individual consciousness and individual consciousness and reasoning, as well as of societal reflection, rather than being in the procession of state agencies, museums, or newspaper offices. So this leads me to why I am sitting here, born barely a decade after the liberation of Auschwitz, I realized at some point that I was living in uncomfortable closeness to the perpetrator generation. So I grew up with the obdurate silence of my parents, including about my father's Nazi party membership. And I think what was said before about the averageness of the perpetrators 
um, I somehow hadn't to wait for Christopher Brown to, to understand this. Um, over time, everything that had to do with Nazi atrocities became like a second skin to me. So this intensely failed Germanness of mine was later combined with decades of experience in the non-European world as a foreign reporter in Muslim countries in West and East Africa, confronted with a deep-rooted legacy of colonial domination. Um, some years in Southeast Asia, learning how World War II looks through the experience of the Japanese occupation. And most importantly, I got a feeling through friendship and love how people look from elsewhere on us Europeans and our history. So all this has motivated the search movements which are at the core of my new book. And it has emerged out of an inner dialogue, out of two great personal concerns. Um, first, that Germans, the new ones, as well as the longtime Germans as me, keep the Nazi crimes in their consciousness with sensitivity and care, and at the same time overcome the typical white and Eurocentric way of thinking about history and their own place in the world. So as a principle, I think the Shoah is a tragedy of special significance, but this significance must never be used to degrade other sufferings. The Germans should not should not place themselves into the center of their own narratives and have to accept that in today's world people look at the extermination of Jews from different angles and they also look at Israel from different angles. And yes, I think it is possible to explore all these questions in a nuanced and a non polemical way. I did it by traveling through a multitude of perspectives. And by the way, also including um, the Eastern European perspective about which we perhaps will speak later. And I always had with me a suitcase of open questions. So this is the end of my personal in introduction. I will respond first to some aspects of the catechism debate. In a second part, I will add to the problems of genocide, my own thoughts about the economy of empathy. And finally, uh, if we have the time, I would like to ask Dirk some questions. So more than one year after the German Catechism has been published, I think we can see with greater clarity strength and weakness of this intervention. Has it served its purpose? If the purpose was to bring a fresh wave of oxygen into a suffocating atmosphere? Yes and no. Yes, because the term catechism became a modern classic of sorts for those who agree um, and uh, even a point of reference, people can relate to this. Maybe mainly as a critique of the five articles of faith and perhaps not to all the other analytical contents in your initial piece. And becoming a modern classic is, of course, a strong point, and um, there was one um, left weekly uh, recently during the uh, docu documentary debate who had um, uh, the headline catechism in action. So this is a modern classic. But I have a but. Such an intervention is also a social act in a particular environment. And as a social act, it can be pro-emancipative or not. So. Dirk entered um, the German saloon with two loaded guns and, in addition, a knife between his teeth. And I ask myself, what is this guy up to? And who does he think he is? As if there had been nobody else before. So I think there was a good intention, but this good intention was not visible to me. So now, later, in doing some kind of research, I think um, the good intention was to give a covering fire for people whose voices are commonly not heard and who are more vulnerable, in particular those of migrationary descendants. And under the covering fire, they should come forward and participate. So you can already see that um, I translated this into a certain vocabulary which is questionable. 
Okay, so this protective covering fire, <clears throat> it did not happen. Instead of opening the field to new voices, the atmosphere got even more toxic and dangerous. So there was one, I think, entirely unintended lesson. Even a renowned foreign professor of genocide studies can be drawn through the gutter in Germany and be accused of being an anti-Semite and hardly anybody comes to his defense. And that was a big collateral damage. Getting out there was now even more difficult than before, particularly for those who Doc Moses wanted to support. I myself, I retreated from the debate in utter frustration and um, decided that it's time to do something in a very different style and on a very different level. I have, um, there is another layer of critique. Um, I think the catechism contains um, a flawed reading of German society, and I would apply also this partly to your presentation now, um, although I agree to a lot of points you have, and, and I, I admire greatly how you update this to the last moment, and you could even have included my last Twitter on this Vinnetou debate. Um, so I think there we have a lot in common, but still um, I have a principal critique. Mm. Um, so I said, I think the catechism contains a flawed reading of German society, partly flawed reading. And to put it in Dirk's metaphors, he sees a church full of disciplined white people kneeling in front of the catechism. I would rather see a church which is mostly empty and in the churchyard, some people sell a kind of drugs and around this church, there is a rather rugged landscape. So don't take the intellectual discourse and the media battlefield for the entire society. I think in doing so, you overlook two important phenomena and one is a good one and the other is a bad one. So the good one is, despite the aggressive rejection of multi-directional memory by some influential journalists and historians, um, German memory culture is beginning to accommodate a greater range of historical memories. Various local initiatives, as you know, advocate for decolonizing the urban space. And in some cities, for example, in Stuttgart, um, there is a person of color now in charge for memory politics. Museums and state agencies begin to confront a colonial past, although, of course, painfully slowly. So now the second overlook phenomenon is the bad one. I think there is a growing indifference, apathy, and sometimes revisionism visible in the far right as well as in mainstream society. After we had the corona de uh, denial demonstrations um, where people attached uh, yellow stars to their jackets, uh, the forthcoming social protests against the high energy costs in this autumn um, had already sent the first slogan, and this was Nuremberg trial 2.0. And this was directed um, against the Green Minister of Economy. So I think a lot on both sides, on the better and on the worse side, is not adequately mirrored in the publicized um, and media discourse, which is your main field of reference, of course. So I think there is a top-down approach applied also in the anti-catechism, and this leads perhaps automatically to some misreadings of, of current challenges. Although I think we might not have different opinion on the challenges as, as such, I think. Um, I noticed now comparing your presentation and um, the um, catechism text, which I read again yesterday, that you changed in one point, I think your position um, in the original text, you arg argued still that due to internet, um, the priestly censors cannot control the conversation anymore, like in the 90s or 80s. And I think meanwhile, 
also you, you, you witnessed that um, the internet is also a kind of mobilizing, a very dangerous mobilizing space for, for, for the things we don't like to see. So I, I can shorten this. Um, so I observe with, with, with growing dismay a new dynamic in which constantly societal forces are mobilized along certain ideological lines. And I think um, the state actors are often not the most problematic figures. So I want to point to one, um, I think I call this, this sorry, oh, I try to emerge. Right? So these in ideological lines can be in open contradiction, as you also said, Dirk, to de facto evidence, to the outcome of studies and to court rulings, as in the case of BDS, but they are treated as serious statements. And so I call this a tendency towards a publicly accepted madness, which rather equals Trumpism and not catechism. This includes the constant repetition of lies and the involvement of crown witness, witnesses as key actors. And one of the most influential persons claiming that anti-Semitism is an immigrated, so a Muslim problem, has himself a Muslim Arab name. And he was recently also on the forefront of a defamation campaign against the later elected new federal anti-discrimination commissioner, a German Turkish woman and longtime activist. She was accused to be racist herself, an anti-white racist, and the person with the Muslim Arab name could publish his aspersions in the online journal of the Central Jewish Council. So I think here we see how complicated the situation is. Unfortunately, the voices at the top of the Jewish Council have become influential partisan actors in various opinion struggles. So we witness today, in my opinion, a multi-layered discourse of public irrationality and witch hunt, which troubles me much more than the catechism. And the internet is often not a tool of greater diversity, but rather an echo chamber in which the influential agents can mobilize their pawn army. I think these are politically right-wing discourses in the disguise of virtue signaling which can have um, the shape of supporting Israel, but also to supporting Ukraine. So there is a confluence of discourses, as it was in the case of this um, Abbas affair. There was a twist against Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Scholz being silent in the face of Abbas, but also because he is constantly attacked, not delivering enough weapons to a nation as proudly defending herself as Israel does. Or take the claim of the post-colonials being everywhere. I mean, these scapegoats are not only guilty of anti-Semitism, but of not supporting Ukraine enough because they do not buy enough into Western values. So to sum it up, this is a struggle over democratic discourse, public space and rationality. But in the meantime, we ought never forget that this intellectual and media battleground does not constitute the whole society. And also maybe it does not influence the whole society as much as we often think. Take the documenta. Half a million people visited happily the documenta in a time when it was defamed as a horror show, and with regards to anti-Semitism, the most important dam breakage since World War II. So half a million people, um, exactly as much as uh, went to the documenta um, the last time, um, were not at all concerned about this kind of uh, claims which occupied our, our time meanwhile so much. As an observer, as a citizen and as anti-fascist, I think we have to readjust and to reconsider our understanding of what we do and how we do it. So fighting in these narrowing spaces is important, yes, but I think it is dangerous to exhaust us in this fear. 
and maybe participants from, from Poland, Hungary or elsewhere may relate to this experience in their own way. So pu to put it firmly, I think we should leave the logic of the trench behind us and move towards a new ethical ecology of just memory and equality. So that's perhaps something to put down for the later plenary um, discussion. Uh, the logic of the trend versus a new ethical ecology of just memory and human equiness. And that can only grow from below. Okay, so this leads me to the positive second part of my response to Dirk, in which I would like to put in the most productive way, my little sailing boat along, alongside um, Dirk's big vessel of problems of genocide. Um, in my book, I'm, I, I try to make people part of my own personal struggles to overcome the deep inherited limitations to put ourselves in a frame of human equality. And I think this is a key word. Apparently, Holocaust education and Holocaust memory has not brought us much closer to a sense of equality and instead, as shown in the German example, has led to exclusionary attitudes and to the construction of victim hierarchies. And this is broken down to one simple sentence, perhaps um, an important feature of the content of, of Dirk's 500 pages. I address this in my book as the political economy of empathy. And I was, <laughs> I was vain enough to think that I invented the term, but I re learned recently that others like um, Stephen Eschheimer used it well before me and um, even in the same sense and direction. Um, so to become aware of what steers our empathy individually and collectively open doors, opens doors to a more inclusive culture of remembrance, as well as to a more just approach to human rights issues of the present. So let us briefly take the example of the Ukrainian war refugees. Until the beginning of the Russian invasion, Ukrainians in Germany were considered cheap workforce, um, usually in, in underpaid um, jobs for nurses caring for the elderly in private homes. They had no voice, no lobby, they didn't belong to us. The picture has changed entirely since the German public and media consider Putin's war to be a war against us, the West. The refugees are part of this we group. And they are allowed to work and have access to social security benefits quite differently from the Syrian refugees who arrived um, before them. So empathy is steered by political assumptions and these assumptions make victims be perceived as similar to us, but might also make them appear uncivilian alien. I think it is important that we do not confuse empathy with sheer emotion. Empathy is foremost an intellectual operation, a tentative identification with another person. And therefore the title of my book is um, so to grasp the pain of the other and not to feel with the other. Most important in this process is whether we consider the other equal to us as a human being on eye level. So if we apply these ideas to memory culture and to the categorization of victims, we can easily see how political assumptions and structural racism are intertwined. This is easily visible in the neglected status of colonial victims, but how exactly does it work? In my book, I compare the German perception of Jewish resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto and the East African resistance against German colonial rule some 40 years earlier at the, at the beginning of the 20th century. In the Maji Maji war, which Dirk already mentioned, approximately 200,000 Africans were either shot or starved. It was a desperate liberation struggle and a case of disastrously asymmet asymmetrical warfare. So why is the resistance in the Jewish ghetto enjoying so much respect and empathy, whereas the Maji Maji liberation fight is of no interest at all, raising no respect and no empathy? Contemporary Germans can easily identify with the fighting Jews, but not with the fighting Americans. And this is for two uh, chief reasons. Equating themselves with a the Jewish victim is, in general, a strong feature of philosemitic um, German memory culture. So Germans like to put themselves in the shoes of Jews as a way of dealing with suppressed feelings of guilt. In a harsh contrast, 
hardly anybody from the majority society can imagine him or herself being a colonized black person. So there is nothing at eye level at all. Second, whereas the picture of the Jew in Germany in, in, in German collective um, consciousness has changed substantially between the Nazi era and now, the picture of the African human being has not changed much between the colonial era and the present time. Uh, it is said, but one has to say this. If we return now to the comparison between the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and the Maji Maji War, we see what constitutes the difference. Africans are not considered to have a strong and principled desire for freedom, neither in the past nor now. 200,000 of them dying in resistance has no meaning, and the desperate will to fight is not an object of admiration. With regards to divided empathy, we see the most striking contrasts between colonial victims and Holocaust victims, but pattern of hierarchies are also applied to the Nazi victims themselves. Like Roma and Sinti used to be very close to Jews in the Nazi ideology, also constituting, as you know, a race which had to be exterminated entirely. But their status in public remembrance is much closer to African colonial victims, no voice, no respect. So I call them the victims who are not missed. Roma and Sinti remain the most discriminated minority in Europe today. So there is an economy of empathy, which is at the same time an economy of values attached to different lives. We should include in the picture that this economy has also been structured by recent Western wars. And um, I liked Dirk's explanation of, uh, of the picture on the cover of his book, I myself was several times in Yemen. Um, victims of drone strikes in, in Afghanistan were considered collateral damage, or as I put it in my book, as neglectable lives. As if they had never existed is a common statement by the relatives of those victims. Their death has never been acknowledged, not to speak of any compensation. So if we want to be able to develop an inclusive memory culture, we have to repair the psychological and moral damage which the colonial policies of the past, as well as the recent war policies, have afflicted on our consciousness and on our ethical categories. One of the most important lessons of the Holocaust is that there is nothing like a neglectable life. Therefore, I consider efforts to rescue refugees from drowning in the Mediterranean Sea as a model of a well-conceived and active new memory culture. At the same time, it is important to know that the limitations of the white European concept of universalism have already been discussed and challenged some seven decades ago. And this is not surprising at all. Exactly during the time of the Nuremberg trials, European nations were committing mass atrocities in their colonies for which the definition of crimes against humanity were equally fitting. In the year 1947, when the first edition of Anne Frank's diary was released in Amsterdam, the Dutch army annihilated the male population of entire villages in Indonesia during its attempt to suppress the anti-colonial struggle. Until today, Indonesian widows, high in their 90s, fight for the recognition of their suffering in Dutch courts. Also something which was not really represented at the documenta. So I think laws and institutions that are attributed as an outcome of the Holocaust are deeply stained by double standards. And um, so I think coming from a very different side, um, I can very well understand what um, Dirk outlined in his book, also regarding the, the genocide convention. With regards to the connecting dots between national socialism and colonialism, there is a huge gap nowadays between public memory culture and the results of historical research. The term Nazi colonialism has been used by historians for the last 20 years, but is still causing a hiccup of sorts in the German public. I came across one fascinating example with respect to the language used by the Wehrmacht in Eastern Europe. They called the non-German auxiliary forces in extermination camps some of whom were Ukrainians, Askari, exactly as the African auxiliary forces were called in colonial wars 
in German East Africa. The word is Arabic for soldier. It entered colonial parlance through Swahili and from there, through the interwar colonial nostalgia in Germany, it entered the language the Wehrmacht deployed at sites of the Shoah. I finished this part in recalling a picture, a photography, which was shown to me in Mali in the courtyard of a simple mud homestead. The picture showed two black soldiers in the snow of northern France fighting against Hitler, as one million other Africans did alone under French flag. And their contribution to the liberation of Europe has never really been acknowledged. In Mali, the picture of these two black soldiers in the snow was shown to me without any reproach, but as a sign of friendship and, and relatedness. And I think we have, with all our Holocaust memory, not lived up to the simple beauty of this gesture. So to conclude, um, through the climate crisis, we learn now with great difficulty that every human being on Earth has the same right not only to survive, but to live a prosperous and safe life. And we can apply the same principle to memory culture. All sufferings have the same right to be narrated, to be heard and respected. And maybe this basic plenary truth is a far cry from Feuilleton debates. And they are indeed perhaps of no importance at all. Thank you. So I'm at the end of my um, two-step response. So to Dirk, and now is the question regarding time. Um, uh, if I should continue with um, a couple of questions, or maybe Wolf has some other ideas. Well, if you if you perhaps pose your most urgent question, uh, then we give Dirk a, a quick uh, opportunity to respond. So I, I think in in order to start the dialogue with uh, one or two questions, I think that would be fine. Uh, in the meantime, I also want to tell the people uh, in the uh, online audience that you must be welcome to post questions in the chat if you will identify to read or call upon you. So by all means, uh, 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 ask some questions. Yeah, good. Okay, so Dirk, and, and I, I talk a bit personal to you now. Um, I think you have the great ability to take nothing for granted. And uh, the problems of genocide can be read as a long chain of deconstructed assumptions. Um, or more clearly, um, what the reader might have taken for well-researched historical facts is being stripped naked. So you see it's barely more than an assumption usually created out of political interest at a certain time. So I think this taking nothing for granted and not for sacred is the beauty of your work, which I admire greatly. So now there is a question attached, yes. Um, in this context, there is um, one common thread visible in your work and writings. So to deconstruct the position which the Holocaust holds in various regards, in memory politics, genocide concepts, public discourse, education programs, and so forth. And of course, this thread binds together um, the anti-catechism and the problems of genocide. So this looks to some as a one man's crusade uh, to push the Holocaust from its throne. And they ask, what is his motivation? And they assume sometimes it must be something anti-Jewish. So even some renowned genocide historians came up with critique in this direction, and you called this rightly, rightly in my opinion, a paranoid reading. But um, I mean, this critique includes also drawing into doubt the moral substance of your person. And some, as you know, some historians even refuse to sit at a common table with you. Um, so I think we should not avoid this question. And um, I would ask you, would you mind to explain yourself a bit more clearly and perhaps even personally, how this thinking of yours um, developed over the years and where and when it started? I think it could be good to, to have another avenue into your thinking, um, also for all those who cannot read uh, the 500 pages of the problems of the genocide. Thank you. 
Uh, so thank you for your uh, wonderfully sensitive and uh, analytical, analytically uh, acute presentation uh, with which I agree virtually 100%. The only point of misunderstanding, I think, is that I, I don't in fact think that the, the, the system, the memory system or regime works like a church in which the German population kneels before, piously before uh, a clerical class. I think it's more uh, pluralistic and, and rugged and ragged, as you said, with half the people outside the church. And that accounts for the, for the anxiety on the part of the, the clerics, as it were, who are doubling down in their efforts to, to keep everything under control, precisely because Germany is becoming more diverse, um, which I welcome. I also agree with you about these uh, uh, grassroots initiatives at, uh, with local governments and at other levels where there's increasing attention to the repatriation, restitution of uh, artifacts which were stolen or illegally purchased or dubiously purchased in colonial times and so forth. This is happening. Uh, I would also not uh, quite agree that we should just leave the for your turn bubble, so the, the, the sort of journalistic debate uh, to its own toxic self, because although uh, it is exactly uh, a pit of irrationality as you decide, describe, it's also one in which uh, politicians are involved and, and one that they take uh, notice of and participate in. And so it's, it's a conduit to power. And I think if we're interested in the way power works in Germany, we need to uh, dip our toe into this toxic uh, hot tub and uh, to keep an eye on the temperature. Now, to your more immediate question about the reception or mis misreception of my book, only a handful of people it has been positively reviewed by social scientists and, and other historians. Um, let me say the following. Uh, you know, I don't want to be understood as saying that there should not be Holocaust memory or there should be less of it. Uh, on the contrary, I, I think, uh, especially in Europe, where uh, the Holocaust originated, particularly in Germany, but also in the killing fields or the bloodlands uh, further east and elsewhere in Europe, uh, and also in the Middle East, where the, the Holocaust uh, could have uh, extended were it, were it not for German defeat, um, it should never be forgotten. The question is what the modality of memory is. Is it, is it uh, one that's in the catechal mode or is it one that's multidirectional, as Michael puts it, or integrated or relational, which is one that I've been advocating in the catechism piece where I point out that once you disaggregate different elements of the Holocaust, in which, for example, vast numbers of people, including Jews, were enslaved, it also is then part of the history of slavery. Uh, the Holocaust cannot be explained just purely out of uh, the history of anti-Semitism, but also the history of imperial expansion, because that's what the German Empire was. And it was a conscious effort to learn the lessons of imperial history by Nazi elites. I reconstruct this in detail in the book. And to perfect uh, the imperial exploitation and extermination of previous empires, which had done so in a more ad, ad hoc way. The Nazis wanted to do it in a scientific way uh, with the resources of the most modern and powerful state on earth at the time, or one of them. Uh, and so, of course, you got a commensurately more drastic genocide and a series of genocides. Uh, the Nazis understood their, their crimes and cri crime and crimes as of world historical significance. This needs to be reconstructed and understood. I think it's a, a, a regime and criminality of world historical exist, uh, significance, uh, but it's a, it's it's one that it can't be understood purely through the lens of anti-Semitism. But you know, ra racisms of all type, yes, anti-Semitism, imperial expansion, and so forth. And uh, so the lessons you can draw from this experience are much more varied and complicated than the somewhat tidy, pat, and frankly trite lessons about toleration, uh, which we see in, in sort of genocide and Holocaust pedagogy. Mind you, I'm all for toleration, right? But I don't think we can limit the, limit the lesson at that. Now, you asked me to, to briefly talk about 
in my own intellectual journey, how it led to this book, where I'm, I'm, I, which is in a sense a kind of unmasking of the history of the genocide concept and of the work it does in the international system, which as Wolf Kunsteiner uh, and you accurately portrayed, works uh, effectively to screen out other forms of mass state violence uh, and, and effectively license it because it doesn't measure up to uh, genocide, which is fetishized as the crime of crimes. So other crimes aren't, aren't so bad. Uh, they're still crimes like crimes against humanity or war crimes, but no one seems to care as much. I mean, that's why you see, for example, the intense efforts on the parts of Ukrainians, say Uyghurs, Rohingya representatives to mark their experience as genocide because they want the international attention. In my view, why, why aren't crimes against humanity bad enough? You know, how did we get into this hierarchy? Uh, so the, the book is to some extent a history of that. Uh, uh, I came to the conclusion that genocide as a concept in law was as much a problem as a solution to mass violence against civilians after spending uh, quite a number of years in trying to engage in conceptual stretching, in trying to use the genocide concept, uh, particularly in relation to colonial genocides, because this could be a, a, uh, a concept uh, that would be useful for indigenous intellectuals. Here I was working at the University of Sydney. Of course, I had indigenous colleagues down the corridor uh, with whom I was uh, closely engaged. And uh, I, I, I published a number of edited books, essays, and, and organized uh, academic conferences about genocide and colonialism in order to highlight the genocidal consequences of settler colonial expansion in Australia and eventually then around the globe as the concept went global. I, of course, was not the only one doing this. There were a, a cohort of us Gen X uh, historians and political scientists and literature scholars. Let me say that 19 years ago, I organized the first ever conference, I think, on genocide and colonialism at the University of Sydney and Michael Rothberg and Jürgen Timmer were there. So, you know, we've been cooking this up for quite some time. And there were intensive debates with German and other historians about these issues 15, 20, 25 years ago. And there's an historiography on genocide in German Southwest Africa that goes back to the 70s. So, you know, academics have been doing this for a long, long time. There's nothing controversial in what we're saying. It's very different, though, with uh, German public culture, you know, what journalists and, uh, and politicians understand as uh, what's allowable and what's not allowable in the public sphere. And it's when I, of course, saw that intellectuals and academics like um, Bembe and Michael Rothberg were savagely attacked uh, by know-nothings, frankly, ignorant journalists and politicians, uh, but with this you know, incredible smug moralism that I thought, you know, I think it's time just to write a little 3000 word essay saying, you know, guys, uh, I don't think you're right about this. And frankly, you're being bullies. And uh, why, why do you think you can, you can write about this and treat people like this with such uh, moral self-confidence? You know, a bit of epistemological uh, humility isn't a, a bad idea. I'm constantly learning. I'm kind of decent to myself in these debates because you're absolutely right, Shorter, they're toxic masculine, and I don't want to be uh, to participate in that. And so I think at this point, I'll stop talking. <laughs> Okay. Uh, since we had some technical problems, I still want to invite the audience also online. If you have questions, please uh, post them uh, in the chat, which uh, we then I'd try to, to pick up. Um, I don't know, Charlotte, if you have some other uh, questions right now you want to uh, add? Yes, if there are not more urgent questions from the... Um, Go right ahead. Room. I um I would like to take the debate a bit a bit forward into the less well chartered areas um, we have now with relation to the war in Ukraine and um, I would like to pose Dirk some questions about the use of memory in wartime and um, I think um, whereas we have still in other parts of the world still uh, the case that um, some try to um, attach their own grievances to the Holocaust just to benefit from the higher prestige uh, of the Holocaust. And we see at the same time now um, in Europe um, that Holocaust remembrance is becoming more fragile 
uh, through historical revisionism and, and hijacking. So sometimes the phrase Putin is the new Hitler is now employed by the same people who used the singularity thesis just a short while ago as a weapon against the inclusion of the remembrance of colonial victims. So I would like to ask you, what is your take on this co uh, contradiction? And um, do you think, again, based on the catechism thesis, that remembering the Holocaust is secured? Um, so um, do you think that my concerns regarding revisionism and um, um, a fragile memory are overstated? And moreover, since you have just published also an essay about partisan history, um, what is your recommendation when it comes to dealing with terms um, which are so heavily charged with Nazi crimes like Vernichtungskrieg, the war of annihilation or deportation? So is the overwriting of these historical terms necessary and to which extent? And how to draw a line then to distortion and and um, a revisionism. And I would like to add that those in Germany who favor negotiations with, with Russia to end the war tend to defend the sole Nazi meaning of these terms. And those who regard Russia as a fascist or pre-fascist and they plead against negotiations are willing to override the terms. So is this part of what you call the diplomacy of genocide and, and how to avoid the pitfall? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Charlotte. That's a, a, a series of very uh, urgent and but also complex questions. I presume you're talking about German actors now rather than, say, actors in Lithuania or Poland uh, or, or Ukraine. Can you clarify, perhaps? So I know well, uh, how to answer. Um, I mean, regarding the, um, the, 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 the terms so much charged by, by, um, by Nazi history, I talk about the German um, perception. But um, if it comes to the more fragile and hijacked memory, I think this is um, an important part of uh, several Eastern European societies now. Right. Well, I, I think your your observations are correct, and I think you you've seen them more at, at first hand than I have, because I haven't been in Germany for a month or so. Uh, that you know the the partisans of Holocaust uniqueness and uh, Israel solidarity are, are quite happy to use Nazi analogies for Putin, uh, and they're very pro-Ukrainian, and uh, it can. It can also then work in the other direction where the pacifists tend to be sympathetic to Russia or at least uh, uh, give it a free, a free pass. Now, this, I think, to some extent, is, is the inevitable outcome of this post-Holocaust perpetrator society I was talking about. So rather than me say, well, you're right and you're wrong, I, I'm, I'm looking at a field of discourse in which the symbolic system is structured by the inevitability of making Holocaust and Nazi analogies. It, it, it's, it's very difficult for Germans to, to escape it. Uh, and I don't want to engage in finger wagging uh, about it. I'm just sort of observing that this takes place. I think as, as uh, scholars, we can sort of, uh, sort of pass out how and why it works and then, and then call for call for calm and moderation. Now, some, some historians have done that. There was a, an interesting interview in the Tuts with Uri Herbert, yeah, the no. great you saw yeah, in the- Controversy. Yes, mm -hmm. that's what you're thinking of, where he criticized Timothy Snyder for using these World War II analogies, among others, uh, for Putin. But um, you know, the, the problem with sort of an ultra-historicist approach where, which argues that you know you can only use Nazi terminology for the Nazi period and has no translatability uh, to any other context is that, well, sometimes there are continuities in styles of warfare. And uh, the, 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 the modality of, uh, of Russian warfare is completely degraded in the way it just shells entire cities to the ground in which civilians are inevitably caught up. And it's not necessary to, to say uh, this is what the Nazis are doing, I, as I agree with him. If, the, if, the, if Russia was as mobilized 
uh, now as Germany was in 1941, when it invaded the Soviet Union, this war would have been over uh, within a few days. And that's not happening, right? But still, the the you know people are genuinely and understandably shocked by what the uh, Russians, how the Russians are conducting their warfare, let alone that they've conducted. You know. But uh, you know, a, a more global sensibility to pick up some of your themes, Charlotte, who would be say, why aren't we shocked by what's happening in Yemen? Why aren't we shocked by what's happening in parts of the Tigray region in Ethiopia? Uh, and refugee crises elsewhere. Now, there is a simple answer to that, because this is happening, for Europeans, this is happening on their doorstep, and the refugees are in their countries. So I don't think it's actually uh, an indictment of Europeans that they are more interested in this, in this case than in others. It's entirely understandable. Right? Now, I, I, I'm not giving you a, a yes and no answer to some of your questions, but, uh, you know, I think, as, as Habermas said in his valuable intervention on these debates in uh, late summer last year, uh, it all depends on the intention. People will compare and make analogies, but is the intention uh, apologetic or are they trying to reveal a truth about a phenomenon that can be uh, that can that can occur in, in making a subtle analogy? So I think we need to look at these things on a case by case basis. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I want to highlight one comment in the chat that is uh, making the, I think, very appropriate argument that for post-war German society, there was something to be gained by engaging in uh, a, a memory of self-criticism vis-a-vis uh, the genocide of European Jewry, while there seems to be little to be gained in terms of political economy uh, by uh, engaging in apologies and reparations to uh, African societies. I think an, an interesting comment. Uh, maybe if I can add one uh, thought myself now at this point in time, uh, I think we all pointed rightly out that uh, memory culture is different from intellectual debate. Uh, memory culture needs a certain type of, it needs some clear lines. It needs uh, narratives, it needs uh, iconography. And, and so there's a certain complexities that perhaps uh, don't, cannot be, um, they cannot be practiced to the same extent in popular memory culture. So therefore, it often comes back to the question, since we have a solid story, a solid story that seems to be designed to combat at least one type of prejudice, uh, is it not possible to, which we always hoped, that the fight against anti-Semitism, for example, is actually teaching us how to fight against other types of uh, of prejudice, so that would be one of the questions I have. Is it is it not still possible to amend this and make it make it broader without abandoning the the principle of that memory? That's one question, and the other one in terms of effective communication in the feuilleton bubble and outside of it, uh, you know, maybe it's tricky to try to if if these people are bullies, maybe it's tricky to have them see the light and change their modes of engagement by way of a very aggressive critique. You know, that could be another uh, possible question. So, you know, that's in that sense counter, perhaps counterproductive. Uh, if there, you want to. Oh, Charlotte wants to. Speak. Yeah, let's hear from Charlotte. No, I think just would like to add that regarding this, um, um, difference or not so big difference between anti-Semitism and racism in general. I think also here, I think uh, a certain part of society doesn't see this as such a problem. Um, so it's a little bit like an artificial problem, I think, and um, uh, which doesn't mean, of course, Dirk, maybe you understood me a bit wrong before. I don't say we should retreat entirely from this <laughs> from this battleground of intellectual discourses. Of course, no, uh, we shouldn't. But I just said we should not um, exhaust ourselves sure. because okay. I think we really we have to do positive things and we have to we have to widen the space. And this is, I think, the most important task at the moment. I think. No, I agree with that entirely. Yeah. Uh, okay, may, may I please go on. before you? Yeah, be, uh, before no, you please go on. Yeah. Before you perhaps come uh, back again to the to the wartime uh, use of memory, I would just like to add one remark and or ask you. Um, 
I think um, the, the level of historical knowledge in German society, as well as in others, is much lower, I think, than we often assume. So, and this is my problem with overwriting the term of the annihilation war, because I think until now, um, most of the Germans have not really understood what, what it meant. And so the, because, and also because the attention was so much um, focused on the Holocaust, on the, um, uh, on the extermination of the Jews. So somehow <laughs> it, it escaped in a certain way that um, and millions of people just of non-Jewish ordinary civilians um, were destructed during this, this war. And so then as this dimension of the annihilation war is not really acknowledged until now, um, I have the problem that now, um, even as we have this transgression also of military campaigns into maybe genocidal politics, still there is this huge difference um, between, the, between the dimension of the Nazi crimes and what happened just now. And, but so many people don't really see this because of a lamentable lack of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. I, and I don't really have anything to add to that because I, you know, I think as always, we, we agree on almost everything. Uh, so, so just maybe the emphasis is a bit different here and there. Uh, Wolf, are there more questions in the chat? Uh, the uh, uh, the people in the chat are asking, uh, there was one question about specifically the case of France, but it was also partially answered in the chat. Uh, so in that sense, I don't pick up uh, any pressing um, questions uh, right now. Could I ask uh, Charlotte? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Charlotte, I, you've, you've been uh, presenting your book at uh, public events. Uh, I'd like to ask how, how, how has it been received by the publics at those events? Um, so I will, uh, I will start more in autumn to, to go to the public readings and um, uh, as far as I am now, I have planned a couple of readings where I try to relate my book into, um, into local initiatives regarding um, a different memory culture. So starting like from uh, in Cologne, there's one Armenian um, a memorial for uh, the Armenian genocide, which had the beautiful inscription, um, um, our your pain is the pain of all. And, but it was, um, it had to be removed because there was no public um, introduction of this and it was a civil society project. So now I, I, I put my book in the effort so to bring this thing back into public. And there are others also on the uh, post anti-colonial or decolonized um, local level. But in general, I think the reception of my book was quite friendly. It also came on um, a list of the best nonfiction uh, books of the summer. Um, but still, I felt that um, many people so far read the book um, for which it was not really written. But the people who might um, agree to the anti catechism or whatever, and then they told me um, it was a detoxing book. So they could come to a rest reading my book because they thought, well, here we have, we have all of it, but we have it in a way um, so we can talk about this maybe with our aunt or with our neighbor. It's not like a secret uh, competitive knowledge. It's something which is quite accessible and, and, and not so exotic at all. That's excellent. I'm very pleased to hear that. Yeah. Uh, that sounds indeed like a, a very nice, uh, and very positive uh, place uh, uh, we can end on a on a, an idea that uh, there's a there's in your book um, a strategy for dealing with this uh, conflictual memory that's quite accessible, and and uh, outlines also uh, a way forward. Thank you. Um, I think we should not uh, overextend the patience of our audience. I want to thank uh, all of you. I want to thank you, uh, Charlotte, for joining us on short notice and for your very thoughtful remarks. I want to thank Dirk, of course, uh, for being here. I want to thank Jaco for the support. And I'm apologizing again for our technical problems uh, that have caused some delay 
uh, we are hoping that uh, at least in in some parts of our discussion will survive uh, uh, online so i close this for now uh, thank you very much and uh, hopefully we'll see each other soon on other occasions live and uh, online thank you thank you very much and a safe, a safe, safe return to your dog to us <laughs> thanks Charlotte. Yeah.